If you have a pen and paper handy, I'm going to have you write down a one-word answer. And if you don't, no worries. I'd love for you to come up with one word to what I'd consider to be one of my favorite questions. Now, before I ask the question, I'm going to tell you that most people would like to sit with this question longer than you're going to have right now, but no problem. You'll have all the time in the world after our event is over today. The question is very simple. It's what makes you great at what you do? You might be an engineer, you might be a teacher, you might be a nurse, you might be a business professional or a gardener or whatever it is that you do. What makes you truly great at it? My intention today is to help you to get better results. It's to help you to tap in to that greatness that you have within, within yourself and then to have fun in the process because that's really the bottom line, isn't it? You want to navigate through your day accomplishing things and making an impact, but you also want to have fun at the same time. So for the last 16 years, I've traveled the planet talking to people about personal development because I really believe that when you develop yourself, when you expand your capacity, not only do you get better results, but you create ripples and you affect the people closest to you, and then that ripples far beyond what you can see. I think that all too often people miss the fact that their activities, no matter how big or small during the day, really do impact people much broader than what they can see. I love what Mother Teresa said. She said, don't worry about the masses, help one person at a time, and start with the person nearest you. That mentality literally can change the world. So let's start with the assumption today that the results that you're going to get, no matter how big they are, they extend far beyond what you can see. So this talk is called The Anatomy of Results, and I believe that every result has three moving parts. You could call it three components, if you will. They're intention, state, and action. So to define these things, intention is, now this is your goals and your dreams, this is your life vision, this is your plans, it's everything that lives in your mind that you're imagining is going to happen in the future. This encompasses intention. Now your state, state is your state of being, it's your state of presence, this is your optimism and your pessimism, it's your courage and your conviction, it's also your doubts and your fears. State is the energetic quality of how you show up every day. And then lastly, we have actions. Now, actions are very self-explanatory. Actions are simply what you do. So what I'd like you to do right now is let's take a deeper look at these and let's quantify them. What percentage do each of these components have in the results in your life? So if you believe that they're all equal, then you're going to jot down 33, 33, 33. And if you think that one of them is inherently stronger or more impactful than the other ones, then you'll weight them accordingly. So in your mind, just consider intention, state, and action, and what sort of an impact do they have on the results that you get. So you guys are already warmed up. This is going to be easy. What I'd like for you to do right now is I'd like you to just shout out, don't be shy. This is some more interaction. What number did you come up with for intention? Please just call them out. 10, 20, 50. Anything higher than 50? 60, 70, 80, 95. Okay, great. <laughs> well, that's an awesome range. I heard everything from 5 to 95, so terrific. So let's, let's look at state. What are your answers for state? Call those out, please. 75, 45, anything 20%, anything lower than 20%? 10, okay, good. Anything higher than 75? It's kind of like an auction up here, okay, good. So then let's finish up with action. What percentage does action? 100, okay, good. What else? 40, 30, 35, good. This is a great conversation piece, and this is a great way for people to interact in a very thoughtful manner. Now, I love this exercise for the sole fact that you have incredibly different answers, and you're obviously an interested and intelligent group of people, yet your answers largely contradict each other. So what gives with that? Well, there's not a right or a wrong answer to this question, but I will suggest that how you look at this question will radically impact your results 
and it'll also impact your experience along the way. What most people tell me is most people, and I've asked this question of literally thousands of people along the way, is that most people will tell me that intention is somewhere between 15 and 20% of the equation. Somebody got the right answer, very good. <laughs> And not the right answer, but the most common answer. I commonly hear that intention is about 15 to 20 percent, state on average is somewhere in that 15 to 20 percent, and that action is 60 to 70 percent of the equation. Most people believe that action is the predominant part of the results that they get. Well, if you look at rule benders, if you look at people that are not getting normal results, I call these elite performers, and elite at whatever it is that they do, you'll notice that their answers are remarkably different than what I've got right here. Take Kristen Armstrong, for example. Kristen won the gold medal in the 2008 Olympics. She's a two-time uh, two world champion. Kristen and I have gotten to know each other as I was invited to speak at their spring training camp this year. And I asked the entire team the same question that I just asked you. What percentage does intention, state, and action have on the results you get? What impact is it? So Kristen chimed in right away, and she said, you know, Eric, I don't really know about intention and action. I'd have to think about that more. But for me, state is absolutely 60 to 70% of the equation. And I look at all of the different competitors, and they all have an intention. They all want to do something. And of course, we're all taking incredible amounts of action, watching our diet, working with our coaches, training, training, training. But a very select group actually stands on the podium. And she said, when I win, I know that what's unique about it is the state that I show up in. And I think that's fascinating, considering this is a person that's training for years to compete in an event that takes about 30 minutes. So Dr. Peter Johnson is the director of gynecologic oncology at Aurora Health. He's also a clinical professor at the University of Wisconsin. Basically, what Dr. Johnson's done is he's helped pioneer a form of robotic surgery that is now the standard of care in helping tens of thousands of women beat cancer. So in his incredibly impactful career, he'll also be the first to tell you that along this road, in the operating room, many people considered him an incredible jerk. And that it became so severe that he was actually suspended from working with medical students because they were worried that he would taint their experience. So Dr. Johnson and I had the opportunity to spend four days together at a retreat that I lead each spring when he was really sitting with this, quest, this question of intention, state, and action. And I asked him, I said, what really makes you great as a surgeon? Like, what's the essence of it? And what he said didn't surprise me. He, he said, you know, after really considering this, it's humility. It's showing up with the state that I'm there to serve and heal people and that I don't know all the answers and that I don't need to know all the answers. And that's not unique to Dr. Johnson at all. I asked so many physicians about this, and the answer that I'm hearing over and over and over again is that intention is about 30% of the equation. For Dr. Johnson, state is 65%. Different forms of doctors told me, person after person, when asked, what makes you great at what you do? It's things like passion. It's things like genuinely caring, being still and listening to people, which, especially in their profession, is fascinating because after their undergraduate, then they go to medical school, and then they've got their internship, and then these are men and women that most of them have done fellowships. I mean, 15, 18 years of formal education, how much of their education was dedicated towards passion? How much of the curriculum helped them to be more genuinely caring? What they told me, zero. And that's not unique to physicians. Look at any line of work. Look at any calling. And most technical training is geared towards things that are not the answer that you came up with at the beginning of this talk. Go back to what you came up with that really makes you great at what you do, and you'll find that it's a state. Top performer after top performer, rule benders, if you will, constantly tell me that state is at least 60% of the equation. Most CEOs that I talk to about their huge global organizations will credit action to 5 to 10% of the ultimate results. So now, I want to be really clear about this. I'm not at all suggesting that actions are not important. Your expertise, 
your technical training, and certainly all the effort that you put forth, this is incredibly important. What I would say is this is the, com this is the lowest common denominator that re is required for you to be able to do what you do. This is fundamentally a multiplication formula. You're gonna take your intention and you're gonna multiply that by your state and then you're gonna multiply that by action. Now, if you don't do anything, you get zero results. So actions are a huge part of this entire equation, but it's not the catalyst to greatness. It's not the catalyst to growth. So often people try to increase their efforts by doubling their actions. And that comes with collateral damage. It comes with collateral damage to relationships and then to physical health. So if you want to grow, if you really want to take things to a different level, look to state. Look to how you're showing up energetically and things can really, really shift. So how do you do that? You know, how do you change how you show up energetically? Well, I have tons and tons of ways that people can do this, and I'll suggest that there's three that you can immediately begin doing, and they're three of my favorites. The first one is to hold your intentions lightly. You've got these dreams and you're, you've got these goals, and if you look at people that are bending the rule of norm, what you'll notice is that they have an amazing way to hold on to things lightly while they're chasing after them. Uli Steck showed this to me in the most crazy way on Mount Everest last year. So Uli Steck is regarded by many as the greatest mountaineer on planet Earth. He's certainly the fastest. He set the speed record for climbing the north face of the Eiger in the Alps. Now, this is traditionally a three-day climb. Reinhold Messner set one of the old records at eight hours. Uli Steck set the current record at two hours and 47 minutes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Go on YouTube and watch him. He literally runs up the north face of the Eiger. <laughs> so a year ago, he set out to climb three 8,000-meter peaks in the Himalaya, Mount Choyoyu, Shishapangma, and then finally Everest in less than 30 days. Now, Choyoyu and Shishapangma on their own, these are 30-day climbs, and my expedition on Everest took 62 days to get up to the top and down. So he's going to compress 120 days of climbing into 30 days. He successfully climbed the first two, and he's after Everest, and he's totally on track. So when I saw him, it was about an hour after my climbing partner, Scott Patch, and I had stood on the roof of the world. So we were descending about 100 meters below the summit when we first saw Uli, and he writes about this on his website. He said, I was feeling great. I was much stronger than I thought I was going to be, and the suffering wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And he's climbing all of these mountains without oxygen. He's less than one hour away from doing something that is just mind-bending to just about everybody in the climbing community. And Scott and I watched him turn around. He turned around, not because he didn't know that he could get to the top, but because his feet were getting very cold, and he didn't know that he could get back up to the top without getting frostbite and potentially injuring himself permanently. What he wrote is he said, Mount Everest will always be there. I can come back and climb another day. I mean, that's just truly a world-class perspective. And when you hold on to your goal so tightly and you hold on to your intentions like they have to happen or nothing else, you squeeze the life out of them. Take the things that you really care about and hold them gently and just watch what happens. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, <laughs> let's take a look at this. Your focus ultimately determines your state. My good, good friend Roger Seip puts it this way. He says, what you see is what you look for. So I'd love for you, by an honest show of hands, please raise your hands on this one, how many of you have at least one problem in your life today? Can I see the show of hands? <laughs> okay. Good. Now, think about this. How many of you have at least one thing in your life that you're genuinely grateful for that fills your soul? Can I see the show of hands on that? Oh, isn't that awesome? Now, did that feel different to you? Okay, other than the sarcastic laughter on the first question. <laughs> When you focus on gratitude, even for a second, notice how your body reacts. Most of you threw up two hands on the second one. You act quicker, you act with more certainty, and it just feels different. If you have the ability to focus on gratitude, even just for a little bit, and this is a daily practice, you can get massive results, and this really spreads to the people in your life. Focus just a little bit on your state every single day.
So we're going to wrap up our talk where we started with, and that is that big impacts are little ones put together. So remember what Mother Teresa said, start and help one person at a time and start with the person nearest you. Well, sometimes the person nearest you needs to be you. Mike Yunker taught this to me in the most amazing way. I met Mike a couple of years after we started our company when he came to work with us. And Mike was just one of these guys that when he walked in the room, the whole room lit up. He had a smile on his face. He was focused on something positive. He would literally wake up in the morning, and the first words out of his mouth were, it's going to be a great day. <laughs> so think back to the first words out of your mouth today. <laughs> That'll give you something to shoot for tomorrow. <laughs> so... I knew that in part, Mike had cultivated this state of being and this perspective because we both worked for the same company when we were in college. The Southwestern Company, based in Nashville, Tennessee, has a sales and a business management program for college students. They work with thousands of college students every summer. And they've been doing this for over 150 years. Their corporate philosophy is that you build people and people build companies. And for 150 years, they've had an incredible track record, so I knew the kind of training that Mike got. Well, fast forward the story, Mike had a traumatic brain injury. He literally passed out from a standing position, and the first thing to hit the ground was the back of his head. He immediately went into a coma, and just to paint the picture of the, the injury, where his brain was injured was on the frontal lobe, because his brain had literally bounced off the back of his skull and hit the front. So for Mike and his entire family, it was incredibly touch and go for, for this period. And I came to visit Mike in the hospital, and, and I had a chance to speak with the doctor and ask him, you know, how, how is it looking? I'll never forget what the doctor said. He, he just looked at me and he said, you know, I have no idea. He's like, the brain is such a mystery. I've seen people with far more damage and far worse shape that have fully recovered, and they went on to leave, lead a normal life. And then I've seen people with far less of an injury that ultimately died. It's going to have everything to do with Mike and his attitude. Well, that gave us a ton of hope. So Mike came out of that coma weeks ahead of schedule, and he literally blinked his eyes a couple times, and the first words out of his mouth were, it's going to be a great day. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that story touched me in so many ways, but the main way that it impacted me was I knew that Mike didn't develop that perspective while he was in a coma. <laughs> he had been building on that for years. Kristen Armstrong didn't wait until she was racing in the Olympics to work on her state. Dr. Johnson doesn't show up in the operating room and then think about how he's going to show up. These are little things that they're doing on a daily basis, and you can do that too. When you work on yourself and you make deposits in yourself, not only do you get better results, but that ripples to the entire world. And in that way, I really do believe that you change the world. Thank you so much for having me.